Welcome to the Hello First Name Podcast. The Hello First Name Podcast revolves around the term personalization and is brought to you by marketing author Rasmus Holin, founder of Omnichannel Institute and chief experience officer at the marketing automation software company Agilic. The podcast is based on the book Hello First Name. Each episode is based in turn on a chapter from the book, followed by a discussion of the very same chapter with an expert marketing practitioner in the following episode. As always, you can buy the book on Amazon or other bookstores. You can also choose to listen to it all for free on your favorite podcast service. You're also very welcome to download the abstract of the book for free, and all models, of course, are able to download. All downloads are sponsored by Agilic. I'll make sure to put a link to everything in the show notes. But you can always connect on LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to reply and help out. Hello, and welcome to the Hello First Name podcast. Thank you for listening in on this episode, which is where we're going to be discussing Chapter 7, namely Insights Part 1 segments, together with Lisa Bjørnkjær, uh, who is the CEO of BellyBalance.se. Uh, and uh, Lisa, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. You you have quite a resume, uh, Lisa. I mean, from uh, management consulting in uh, Capgemini and through customer loyalty and CRM in three, and, and now you're actually the CEO of BellyBalance.se. So, but in your own words, can you can you tell us a bit about uh, yourself and and your career? Yeah, exactly. It started at KTH uh, studying industrial engineering and management. And it's hard to say, I mean, it's a broad education. Uh, so it's hard to say, what, what will I be uh, when I'm finished with this education? But at the first day, we had visitors from Capgemini Consulting saying like, after five years, you will probably start to work at our office or, or any of our competitors. Mm. And five years later, I was entering uh, that office. So that was quite funny. Uh-huh. Uh, so I started as a management consultant uh, straight after uh, my studies. And I was like, yeah, it's a steep learning curve when entering management consulting, doing a lot of things that you wouldn't expect. But I was uh, quite soon uh, introduced to customer experience area. And I just thought that this is what I want to work with, Mm -hmm. like working with improving customer experience, using data analytics and communicating uh, to customer in the the best way possible. Uh, so that was really interesting, doing a lot of projects within uh, the financial sector, but also within a big uh, furniture retailer uh, for a couple of years, hmm. working with their loyalty program. So that was really cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. And after that, uh, <laughs> working within the telecom sector, yeah. and that was also very interesting because when I started there, uh, they were working with <clears throat> you know seasonal campaigns, like yeah. very traditional, like now we have the Black Friday, now it's the Christmas campaign, now it's the summer yeah. campaign, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and when I started, we had our vision that we wanted to, to build something new. We've heard of this marketing automation to work what? more with customer journeys, work more with data um, segments that we will talk about, for yeah. example, and personalization. Yeah. Uh, so from going from that, like traditional campaigns, to have a large team working with marketing automation, data mm-hmm. analytics, and doing more smart things with this, yeah. uh, and when communicating with customers, that was an exciting experience. Interesting. Definitely. I actually had some uh, some talks with people from from the telco industry here in, in Denmark, and uh, one of them she uh, she had this idea that she actually wanted to give up on all the seasonal campaigns and, yes. and only ever talk about the marketing automation. It sounds as if that yes. you have already been down that path. It's very interesting. Definitely. And that's also, I mean, it, it, you can see the results quite quick and that's why you want to continue with this. And exactly. uh, yeah, as, as, yeah, when, when you start to seeing the results, you, you never want to go back. That's how it works. <laughs> Just I like would say. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, um, so yes, that was five exciting years um, at three, definitely. Yeah. And then I moved on and um, I've always been interested in health in general mm-hmm. And through a, a contact, I was introduced to this role at Belly Balance as the CEO. Yeah. And uh, Belly Balance is a small company. So it was going from a big company to this startup kind of <coughs> company with, with a really small team. What? Was must that? be totally different. It was totally different, definitely. Yeah. But I, I, I really like building this marketing, uh, marketing automation team at three. So yeah. I, uh, I was... 
yeah, uh, interested in doing like the same thing at Belly Balance, but more yeah. like being a company, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, so here we are. I've been yeah. there for almost six months now. But but then now you're the you're the CEO, so I'm guessing that I mean even though I also like personalization and marketing automation and such, I also realized that as a company, I mean there's a time and place for everything, and marketing Definitely. automation is probably not where you start. And especially if you're a startup, you're probably struggling, or at least maybe you already have that dialed in. But a lot of startups are spending a lot of time on defining their value proposition and making sure that they go to market and all that all yes. those things are in place before necessarily doing any communication on that. Where are you on that journey? I mean, are you a, yeah. already a well-established brand and position? And uh, have you already created demand or, or has personalization and segmentation already become a, a part of how you're reaching out? Uh, I would say that we are an established brand, definitely. Um, although, uh, I mean, we're working with IBS uh, and gut health in general, but yeah. this is something that people... Uh, maybe don't know uh, that much yeah. about yeah. so we really need to to work with that like what is ibs and yeah. relate that to the symptoms that you can have uh, and for the audience ibs maybe yeah. uh, uh, irritable like, bowel syndrome irritable, so it's, irritable it's about bowel. like a brain gut connection disorder yeah. uh, that gives you symptoms like yeah it could be pain it could be diarrhea yeah. constipation things like yeah. that okay uh, but but it's more like talking about the symptoms symptoms to get people to understand or to reflect uh, or that could be me and that's how I feel but yeah. I yeah so, so do this connection between IBS and, and the symptoms for for people so out basically there. you're selling the solution to something that people don't necessarily see as a, or have you know connected the dots and realize exactly. this is a real problem some have some have visited the doctors and that they they've got the diagnose and they want to to solve this problem but they can't get help from doctors so they find our app and can do it themselves so that's right. something that we we need to to market ourselves uh, talking about the symptoms but also talking yeah. with people that need help but but uh, haven't got that yet yeah. uh, so so it's difficult definitely uh, but i would say i would say that we are an established brand uh, mm. in sweden at least yeah, okay yeah, we're thinking about going out of Sweden, Sweden, but that's another podcast. I yeah, guess. I, I mean, yeah, I like the uh, I like the concept of it. I mean, I'm supposing that it has a bit more purpose to it, and a bit yes. more feeling that you are changing the world for the better than necessarily getting people uh, the new iPhone 15 or whatever. Spot on. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah, <laughs> yep. I could uh, I could appreciate <laughs> that, that. That's, that's the reason, yeah. definitely. But uh, so much uh, great learnings and experience from uh, from my years at, at three yeah. that I can can definitely use in my new role. And I was also thinking that I mean, there's, I mean, if there's there's probably not many things that are more personal than your gut health. I mean, it, it can exactly. hardly get more personal. So nope. I would nope. assume that at some point personalization will be a good thing. Yeah. But. You also need to maybe tread carefully. I mean, the whole thing about creepiness and stepping over boundaries and such could yes. perhaps and become health, health data is really sensitive. So, yeah. so that's the thing. But also, as you say, it's very personal. So, yeah. can we communicate in a good way using yeah. this data? It yeah. could be really good for our users. Yeah. So, that's something that we're working on. It's probably uh, connected with stigma as well. So, it's not something yeah. that you entertain with. Not something that nope. necessarily say aloud. No, nope. no, uh, you should not. Oh. Okay, today we're going to talk talk about uh, segmentation, and, and just from our small discussion here, I was thinking actually that there would be so many other uh, topics that we we, we could uh, be discussing. Also, the whole term about uh, creepiness and um, how yeah. to carefully and implicit and explicit personalization, but that's, that's not the topic of today. But Lisa, you were part of the the expert panel uh, in uh, Stockholm before we did. This is the Swedish version of uh, Hello First Name. I, actually, not necessarily all listeners or viewers know that Hello First Name exists in in three versions. One which is um, with a like, variety of cases, which is the purple one. This one is pre predominantly with the Swedish cases. And uh, you actually, I don't know if, if, if you're the one actually writing it, but there was a case study from uh, from three actually uh, as part of this so so thank you for that at least and since then you've you've been uh, sort of introduced uh, to the to the concept yes uh, but coming back to sort of your view on personalization i mean in your, your words how how would you define the term what does it uh, what does it mean to you uh for me um is definitely about using data in the right way 
I mean, just telling some or using someone's name could be really powerful, although this has been used for, for many years now. But using more data to be more spot on in who you are, what you like, your interests and preferences, mm -hmm. that's really uh, what's what it is about to me. And this is also what I've seen, as I told you, starting at, at three yeah. uh, back in the day, we didn't use any of this. We didn't even use first name um, <laughs> within our campaigns. It was oh, really no. generic. Yeah. It was all about the, these are the, the great offerings uh, during yeah. Black Week or the Christmas campaign. Yeah. And going from that to using name, also your phone numbers, you know, yeah. okay, this email is really to me because this is my phone number. This is my yeah. name. And we had more data about your subscription and your data usage, yeah. et cetera. And th that was really um, making an impact for us and, and creating results. And how, how easy did you find the uh, conversations with uh, colleagues and, and maybe people uh, high up the, the food chain in the, uh, in the companies? How easy did you find conversations with them around the term personalization while avoiding misunderstandings? Yeah. I think it's a struggle in general with, with marketing automation to understand uh, the effect uh, you can have by using it. So I really struggled in the beginning, um, but that was not only personalization or about personalization, but about the thing going from doing these campaigns. I mean, yeah. uh, traditional Wait, marketing departments still do yeah. that um to to a large extent uh, still today i think yeah. um so it, it was a struggle and many of them should yes. i mean, I mean yeah. yeah yeah trying to convince um the management team that we need to go from this um yeah, yeah this kind of working uh, with campaigns to to use more of data and and personalization but when they saw the results they were super happy Yeah. And uh, that that's where um, our team started to grow, and we got money to to actually increase our uh, our team. It's a very interesting uh, topic because I think some businesses have a very high degree of seasonality. I mean, if you are selling yeah. uh, clothes, obviously there's a time for promoting the winter jackets and another time for promoting the bikinis. And yes. I think you have some natural seasonality in that. But with the, uh, I mean, people can drop their phone any time of year, uh, I suppose. Definitely. <laughs> and yeah. um, I, don't know, I don't know, maybe, and is there any seasonality at all with, with, within telco? Is there, a, for instance, the time that, that, that my kids have gotten their first phone, that was start of the school year because I wanted to be able to track them, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to see if they segments. made it. Talking to school. about segments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, but there, there's not a lot of seasonality in within telco. That's that's what I hear. Have the new product launches. I mean, yeah, iPhone obviously. and Samsung launches. But yeah. but um, despite that, there are more like people know that there are good prices during Black Week. So we need yeah. to be there and we need to communicate something. Yeah. But that should be additional, I think, to the marketing automation uh, ground that you've yeah. that you played. Okay. How do, you, how do you see the relation between segmentation and personalization? What, what does that distinction mean to you? For me, um, I think they're more complementary. Uh, I mean, segments is more like, yeah, it's easy to divide your, your customer group or your customer base. Mm. So it's easier to, if you, if you use personas, for example, or yeah. just demographics, um, like, yeah, we have families, we have, uh, we have uh, younger people, We have middle age, uh, yeah, you know this. Uh, no and, bits, yeah. and when we have have that base, we could also start to to use personalization within those groups. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, for me, it doesn't have to be within the groups either. You can use mm -hmm. data all over the customer base and do different things that yeah. could complement the segments that you have. Yeah. So I think that that's how I I I see it. Yeah. Yeah. And I I totally I totally agree because there was. I think there was a at, at one one point in time in the sort of the the preparation for for hello first name I came across some people who thought that if it wasn't visible to the uh, to the end customer that they were receiving something personalized then it was then it wasn't you know proper personalization but then on the other hand I was also talking to a CMO roundtable with a Meta where I realized that a Meta believes that they are they're doing personalized advertising That's what they call it, and that's what they they get their money for, and you know they get their paycheck, and and if so, even though it's, if something that that isn't the the proper way of doing personalization, if you can still get that kind of money for it, I think it's really hard to tell them or convince them that they they got it wrong because 
as I say, the, the paycheck doesn't really lie. Okay. So what do you mean that segments are equal to personalization to them? Yeah. So, uh, so some claim that if you are, I mean, if, if the content, I mean, if you don't have a dynamic ad, right. If, I mean, the ad is like it is and you upload the, the, the ad and there's mm-hmm. no parameterization within a, uh, for instance, ads on, on Facebook. I have never seen that at least. And it, I think it would be super creepy if I was called yeah. out by name. Uh, on yeah, Facebook. definitely. Yeah. Uh, so there's no parameterization. So everything is sort of implicit personalization it yeah. appears to me that i'm getting this by chance but i'm really not why am mm. i getting it i'm getting it because i'm part of a segment so are they really doing personalization or are they just doing just doing segmentation but they say yeah. that they're doing personalization i don't want to claim that they're getting their uh, paycheck on false uh, assumptions so, oh. so we realized actually oh, it's all personalization which kind of makes it even more blurry but we just then see mm segmentation as a subset of that or a, like a weak form or a, um, not so much an either or it's more a, an, an idea mm. of to which extent uh, are we personalizing mm. i um, mean segments to me is some it's based on hypothesis that you think that families are equal yeah but personalization is more like we see in the data that you have some kind of interest or preferences or some yeah. type of behavior so that's why i think it's different it's more like yeah. inside out or yeah. Outside in. So sometimes we, I mean, at least when, when working within marketing automation and, and indeed also here at Agile, we say that segmentation is something you do to your customer database, whereas personalization is something you do to your content. Right. And if you can make those meet in the, in the bow tie of personalization, mm. the beautiful knot that you're, you're tying, then you're, I mean, you, you should try and do that at least for the most uh, important uh, mm. moments of truth. Uh, come, so we're talking about insights today. Uh, the uh, the left side of the of the bow tie, which uh, consists of uh, actually two types, major types of insights. The one being segments that we're going to uh, dive a bit deeper in today, and the other one being uh, moments of truth. Uh, so those are the uh, the two that we use in in Hello First Name. How do you see the distinction? Or can you give, give some examples from from either belly balance or from mm. um, from three or from uh, even digging even even deeper, yeah. deeper digging even deeper into your past yeah. between yeah. the two? So segments and moments of truth. How do you see those two types of insight relate? I mean, moments of truth to me is more triggers. Uh, something happens that you can trigger your communication on, yeah. but also if something changes, you might you might change to another segment that you yeah. belong to that you didn't before, like becoming a mother or father or yeah. uh, whatever it a is. Pregnancy test that changes your yeah, life. Exactly. <laughs> at, at that very moment, something changes. But let's say it's a moment of truth. If you, for example, at belly balance, yeah. um, if you start using or if you go into the treatment that we have, we have yeah. this 11 step treatment. Yeah. So, I mean, you can sign up for the app. You can start use some functions or functionalities mm. that we have in there. For example, a barcode scanner. Yeah. Uh, we can go around and, and finding out if products are good or not to eat. Yeah. Um, but the moment where you enter the treatment, we yeah. see you as our patients. Uh, or our okay. patients. Um, so that's when you 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 join the segment of patients, yeah. uh, but it's also something that we can trigger on, like, yeah. well done, now you get started, yeah. uh, you're on a good journey, and we it's will help totally you fun. through this. Yeah. So so this is where they like correlate, but yeah. I think it could also be. Yeah, they, because we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to define, I mean, they're, they're both groups of customers, uh, so to speak. But I think what, yeah. what really separates them is the fact that segments are a bit more static uh, and, and you do change segments once in a while and we get that a lot. But that's actually mm-hmm. the change of segments. I think that could be referred to as a moment of truth. And so now something happens in your life or you are yeah. considering something or you should be considering something. It could also mm-hmm. be something that you're not aware of. Uh, and then the brand or the company is making aware of, uh, as in the case of irritable bowel syndrome, uh, mm. I suppose, that mm. you're maybe you're feeling bad, you're feeling nauseous, you're feeling constipated or whatever, mm. or feeling bloated. And mm. then you actually meet this uh, uh, advertisement, which is talking about this or a promoted mm. uh, meta uh, ad. And then you see, wow, this this is exactly exactly my symptoms. I think that could be also a moment of truth where you realize. Definitely. Definitely. Now you're in the segment of being aware of something yeah. that, yeah, 
then it's up to us to really to, to communicate in the right way with relevance so we get you into the app. And Which kind of a customer it, segments did you did you use in the past? I mean, at three, for instance, can you give some example of that? Uh, yeah, we started really basic, as I told you, with like yeah. high, medium, low uh, in Vendors spend. Or, yeah, okay, yeah, Vendors, so value yes. based segments. Yes, yeah. value based segments, exactly. Uh, and then we went into this more like, what is the action that you uh, need to take? For example, uh, as I said before, if you um, do have like a large subscription um, with with uh, with lot of data in it. Yeah but you don't use a lot of data. Uh, you should be in the segment of, maybe we should recommend you a lower subscription, yeah. uh, for instance. Yeah. This is the action that you should take. Yeah. You should renew uh, your subscription, uh, but with a low, lower data bucket, yeah. so to say. Yeah. Um, so this was kind of a, of a segment, but also we had segments for, for hardware uh, preferences, okay. and we based that on, on history. What have you bought? Yeah. Uh, have you had different models or, or like the same? Um, uh, same manufacturer uh, all the time. Yeah. And we also segmented based on churn risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that was uh, like a predictive analysis. Yeah. Um, also kind of a value-based uh, segmentation, but more in a like futuristic yeah. prediction prediction area. I mean, this future low uh, customer lifetime value because if you're likely to churn. Yeah, definitely. But it, it was based on a lot of parameters uh, that our analysis team helped us yeah. to, to build. So that was that was great. And that also defined what we were actually doing with this customer, yeah. uh, like communicating a lot or, um, yeah, things yeah. like that. Uh, say a bit more about the like handset preferences. So it is that like if I'm an Apple fanboy, then you know that because I consistently buy iPhones or if I'm more with Samsung or that yeah. kind of, those kind of segments. Yeah. Yeah. And they are... Typically, you use one of them. Yeah. You're an uh, iPhone user yeah. or an Android user. Yeah. Uh, typical segments. Yeah, there you I'm go. Uh, we had some some uh, mix uh, a segment of of uh, mix users yeah. as well, but that was quite small. And how about demographic segments? I mean, there must be like people who had uh, multiple subscriptions for their kids and families and uh, young people. And, and exactly. did you did That's you use them? Good. Yes. We had this family segment, yeah. definitely, or probability of being a family because you had lots of uh, of people in your household yeah, you uh, and, really and, and a lot of subscriptions. Yeah. So I yes. think that's actually a good point because, I mean, you say that you're expecting people to be families because yeah. we never really know, right? I mean, we can have a lot exactly. of data, but what goes on in the customer's life, I mean, that could be, a, I don't know, a club. It yep. could be. Yes. Yeah, you never know. No, you never know why people are paying for other people's <laughs> subscriptions. I guess. No, oh, exactly. Maybe it's your neighbors. You never yeah. know. So, uh, yeah. and how would you use then? Because actually, we could have this talk talk about explicit and implicit conversations, a uh, personalization. Because yeah, um, I have this theory or uh, hypothesis that I mean, if if you're not really certain. And which we just defined that you aren't really uh, certain mm -hmm. of. I mean, is this a family or not? Unless they explicitly told you, then it can be really mm -hmm. hard to, uh, or dangerous to call that out and assume that people are families yeah. and call them out by yes. that and being explicit about you believing that they are family. Because if you're wrong, then it's super weird. So I'm doing this distinction yes. of uh, explicit personalization where you say why you're saying what you're saying, and implicit where it's more could be a coincidence. But this week's theme is. A mobile subscriptions for families, but it looks like a coincidence, mm. but really it's not because I'm just part of that segment. Mm. Did did you ever use that distinction in the work there, like the explicit, implicit personalization? I mean, the product was really smart. Uh, we didn't say families; we say collect your subscriptions. Yeah. So it could be collect if you yourself have two or three yeah. for for some reason, or if you yeah are paying for someone else. Like you yeah. say, it could be. I don't know, helping out uh, in, in some way. So we didn't talk about families, really. We talked about collecting, yeah. but in the background, we we, we um, call them families, yeah. like this is the family segment. So so you're really right about that. You should be really uh, cautious when, when talking about people's life setup. Yeah, and I think I would you call that really... implicit. Basically, you're staying on your side of the fence, not mm. calling out what you assume to be the case. But I guess you could you yeah. could also ask them, 
Yes, exactly. I mean, you I could. Mean, if you're getting the, the zero party yeah. data and if they fill out a profile or if you uh, sign up for a second subscription, then you could ask them, is this for a child of yours or is this mm -hmm. for a friend or? Yeah. Yeah. What was easy in one way is that within the telecom sector, you, you call uh, the customers quite a lot. Ah, yeah. So you can get that information and collect that uh, into the systems. Uh, so that's uh, both good or bad, but in, in this sense, good. You can really. Yeah, the thing about it is, zero party data is that it needs to be updated. And I, yeah, that's yeah, true. I, I yeah, struggled definitely. with the term. Yeah. I struggled with the term at first, just saying, well, this is just first party data. But, but someone mm. gave me a bit of perspective on it, saying that, well, it's called zero party data because you, it's, it's the customer's data and you only mm. borrow it, so to speak. And you, it yeah. will be, if you don't update it, then it will probably get too old or. Uh, it needs mm. updating and, and so on and so on. So in that way, I think it kind of makes sense, uh, even though I still struggle with it. It's zero party data. Yeah. What is that really? But yeah, what is that? <laughs> that really makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So with, it's a good thing to have. Yeah. something that everyone talks about. So we already talked about the, the different segments. Uh, and can we give one or two examples of how that could lead to different uh, creative messaging? So in a either in a marketing automation flow or in a in a black week campaign yeah. or yeah yeah <clears throat> but talking about segments based on <clears throat> sorry data usage um the messages were totally different yeah. because if we wanted to increase your subscription we said for example like we can see that you top up yeah your 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 data bucket a lot yeah. so it's uh, it's better for you uh, it's less costly if you buy this larger subscription yeah. so that was one message to this segment yeah, makes sense and on the other hand, <clears throat> we had the customers that um, bought like a big subscription, but they didn't really use the data. Mm. So that would be really helpful and friendly saying that, hey, you're not really using the data that you have in this subscription. So you can downgrade if you if you like, and please do, and please stay with us for, for another two years. Yeah. So that was better, um, like in the sense to keep the customers and make them happy. Absolutely. But that was different kind of yeah. messages based yeah. on the data usage. And did you have then different uh, tonalities of of those? So you say that you have a you should have a larger subscription. Did, were you using different tonalities depending on whether you thought the recipient to be a family or to be a young dual income no kids or a teenager or or were you using the, the same tone of voice? We actually used the same. Yeah. <clears throat> it was kind of standardized for us to make it easy as yeah. well. Like it was dynamic blocks that we yeah. used and the data was inserted and the message was like popping up based on the data. So we did not really uh, make different tone of voice. It was I th I think that's, kind of the same structure. I think, uh, I think that's pretty same. common also with, uh, I mean, for, for, for a lot of marketing automation, the um, what makes the most value is, is to get a lot of automation flows up and running first that addresses the most important moments of truth. And then secondarily, mm -hmm. maybe, and for some, if you have very different dem demographic segments, you can choose to do different variants of the message. But I find that for 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 campaigns and seasonal campaigns, that's really where the uh, the creative mm -hmm. message can vary a lot depending on your segment. So if you're trying to get, uh, see, I mean, if you're if you're promoting your spring campaign, obviously uh, doing segmentation by gender and having a like the the hero image and the tonality addressing either female yeah. ways of shopping or I mean, it's a bit stereotypical, but just to get the, the point across. Images could be different, not okay. really the text or tonality, yeah. but, but the, the images uh, were different. If you're, for example, could be a family or collecting yeah. your descriptions. All right. But that... there were lots of people in the images then instead of just, yeah, one. that makes, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and I, I think that is, I mean, if it's, I mean, not necessarily referred to as the tone of voice, but it is, a difference to the content and, and what you are placing in front of people and the emotions that you are you're trying to stir or to to awaken. Also, the images uh, are playing a quite big uh, part of that. Yes. Um, coming to to the to the thing about uh, like channel selections. I mean, using outbound communications and uh, either text messaging. You also mentioned the call center. I'm assuming that you're also working with with emails. How would you use the, or did you use the uh, the channels differently depending on the segments that the customers belong to? Uh, that was something that we did, <clears throat> but it was more like a manner of what you did first. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but as you say, the, the high risk customers were called yeah. first, and then the other ones. Yeah. 
Uh, and of course, we prioritized to call them instead of sending an email. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's yeah, right. That's exactly and we wanted to talk to them straight away, yeah. not waiting for them to act on some some uh, text message or or email. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because that that should bring some uh, some cost efficiency. I think there's a there's maybe there's a lot, maybe too much talk about like the effect that you can create with with personalization. I think there's maybe a little mm -hmm. too little talk about the efficiency with which you build it and the cost that I it agree. takes and a, a lot of marketers are doing to my experience they're doing a lot of per personalization for the sake of you know doing the right thing so they don't necessarily mm. for instance put in a control group and and measure the money but they're just doing mm. like three different variants because they believe it's the right thing and it's better because mm. it's yeah because it's personalized and then if they forget to count the money then suddenly some guy from IT comes and turn off turns off their systems because they forgot to count the money and now they're yeah. cutting costs <laughs> I agree, but that's something that we changed <clears throat> when I started at three, because then we did everything at the same time. We sent an email, a text message, and also called the customers um, yeah, on a regular basis. So that was something um, like based on being more uh, cost efficient yeah. that we, let's start with communicating through digital uh, channels and then call them in the end if they have not acted. Interesting. Activities, if, if they were not high churn risk customers. Coming back to the talk about data. Um, there's, there's so much talk about uh, like data management and CDPs and so on mm. and so on and I'm not trying to belittle that uh, in any way it's a it's huge and booming um, part of the of the MarTech industry um, but what I feel is sometimes neglected in this is the more qualitative data uh, have you worked with that in how you're maybe either developing your personas or like did you ever do customer focus groups or how how has the 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 use of qualitative data played a part in in your career not only at three but maybe also at Belly Balance? Yeah, back in the day then, or when I worked as a consultant and built up or made refined and redesigned this loyalty program mm. at this big furniture retailer. We worked a lot with personas. This was before, like talking about marketing information yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And that's that's strange. It's not that many years yeah. ago. Um, but what we did uh, was that we collected a lot of qualitative data from from service and and other um, sources. Uh, so so then we could build up um, our personas based on on hypotheses yeah. on and this type of data that we we had. And what were those? But that was kind of, kind of static uh, personas that we used for for some time. Yeah. And and how did you use those personas? It was when redesigning the loyalty program and the offerings that we okay. had in there. Uh, so we had typical personas like this is the families, yeah. and they they would like the needs and wants of families mm -hmm. um, is this, and then we need to redesign offerings so we have something to to offer yeah. them. And we had teenager uh, building their first first home or not teenager, but but young adults yeah. building their first yeah. home, maybe studying with a low budget, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, things like that. So that was also a static uh, persona yeah. that we we had, uh, and also this fashionista I remember we yeah. had uh, interested in uh, like home styling yeah. and uh, yeah, it, want to spend a lot of money on on building. Uh, his or her home so that was also static persona that we we worked with i think some of the benefits from 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 the personas and uh, and in, indeed you can quite often build those from the the qualitative data is that it it really helps our imagination so coming back to the are we talking exactly. about getting the right segment or are we talking about making engaging content for for those mm. and really for spurring the the imagination of the ones who actually S selecting the images or who are writing the copy or who are doing the small video for TikTok or whatever uh, kind of content we get out there. Thinking, I mean, putting yourself in the head of the persona is much easier than putting yourself in the head of some data segment called whatever. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but it's also, I mean, you need to be careful as well because, uh, I mean, you can be in different personas in in some way. Yeah. You can be a fashionista, but also a young young person and building yeah. your new home or your first home. Yeah. So that was could also be like things to consider yeah. uh, when when building or 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 producing offerings and uh, communicating. And I think in, in general that's that's a pretty important thing. Uh, maybe cover, covering with, with segments that you can indeed belong to many segments at the same time. So it's more, almost mm. like a multi-dimensional thing where you uh, you. 
you're maybe you're belonging to to one demographic segment, more or less. I mean, but you could also be uh, one who doesn't have kids, but kids, but really take good care of your dog or whatever. I mean, yeah, you can still be yeah. family oriented Definitely. without necessarily having kids. Yeah, yeah. Then, but as you say, it's easy to to imagine, and you can relate to these yeah. people. Like, and you can also feel like I'm I'm in this persona. Yeah. Uh, because so, I mean, yeah. I've seen people doing yeah. tests also to I mean, quiz, small quizzes, and, and test yourself and see which of our archetypes that you yeah. belong to, almost like a, a ladies' magazine uh, tests, uh, yeah. which can be quite funny as well. You can do gamification and you can do a, a collection of of email permissions and stuff by doing these small games and gamification. I think that's kind of funny. Yeah. Also, a good way to get the zero party data to help you build your segments. Um, yeah. But also crossing them with the value-based segments. So maybe you have someone who is at churn risk, and that's a that's that's a segment. The ones who are in high churn risk, but there can be multiple types of people being at high churn risk. There can be the ones who have a lot of money. There can be those who don't have a lot of money. There can be those yeah. who are yeah. family oriented, those who are not, and so on and so on. So really, all these yeah. segments, and I think maybe at least in emails, uh, email marketing, and email personalization, that's where a lot of this can come together. So if there's a customer that you are missing and they are, you're doing maybe a, a, an outreach in order to, to, to get him or her back, then like the top part and the creative messaging and so on can be related to the demographic segments, whereas the products that you maybe put in the email, if, if that's appropriate, would be directed to the value-based segments as in how much money would they assumably have? Are they from a neighborhood where people have a lot of money and so on? So I think multiple... Yeah. And and really, maybe that's where it becomes personalization, where you mix these segments and different parts of your communication communication caters to to different parts or uh, different types of segments. Yeah, that's where you create smartness. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah? that becomes kind of a individualization uh, with risk. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Really complex as well. Yeah. But that's uh, what's make it interesting. All right, I think we uh, I think we covered the uh, the questions for today. I only have one question left, which I'm. Uh, I always always ask, and I'm always very uh, curious to hear the answer. So, what is your? I mean, if you as a consumer, what is your favorite example of personalization that you've experienced uh, as a consumer, where you are being personalized towards? Yeah, I always have this one and only example that I like. I love my Garmin watch yeah. and the app that is connected. And I don't think I'm unusual. Uh, saying no, this no, no, no. And I'm wearing the I, I love it so much ah there yeah. you go every day it tells me based on my data what i need to do and i feel like a robot in in one sense yeah. uh but also i think it's great like it it seems like you haven't had enough of water today yeah. so please have <laughs> please go and drink some water now and stand up and walk because i see that have you have not moved for nah. a couple of hours i mean i just love this uh, and I see it as personalization it because is. it knows uh, what I'm doing, yeah. like during the whole day. And I'm also inserting data uh, about a myself. Small nudges to make I, you feel better. I, exactly. Yeah. And this gamification is lovely. Yeah. Like, yeah, you've been out running for three, uh, t three times this yeah. week. What about four times? M make it four. You run and it's four like, times okay, a week. <laughs> well said. You run four times a week. I'm impressed. <laughs> When uh, when it tells me, I will do yeah, it. Yeah, that's that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, so, maybe two or three. Yeah, and I think actually, so so actually, I was speaking at um, Active Leadership Forum, which is a, a conference for um, for the fitness industry. And we were discussing the right. term. I, I realized I was invited as a speaker, and I did a presentation about personalization. And I've hardly ever seen so many people coming up to me afterwards and being like those guys were really into personalization uh, mm. and i realized that but of course i mean your health there's nothing more personal than your health and how you feel and yeah. how you're and and this is like the perfect playing ground for for personalization and i do it mm. myself and i'm i just started tracking my sleep um right and uh, that's good and bad yeah it i mean it can it can be a bit of a good and bad and i've i've, I've see my my resting heart rate and I must yeah. admit, I, actually, I, I think I actually uh, started drinking less alcohol because I see what it does to my resting heart rate and my heart oh, rate. Oh, there you go. And I even went yeah. to bed at half past nine yesterday. So, I mean, something, yep. <laughs> something must be changing. You changed your yeah, life. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for for joining uh, the Thank the you. show today, Lisa. It was a great pleasure um, talking to you uh, as always, and uh, lovely to hear about your experiences from both three and from uh, Belly Balance, uh, which I'm actually I've already recommended a few people in Denmark to check out uh, Belly Balance because I think it's a, such a worth great a great thing. Thank you, uh, and thank you for having me. And uh, the uh, for for the listeners out there, uh, all the the the, the uh, models and the illustrations uh, from the book is uh, available as a download, uh, and I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Also, you can get a um, you can get an abstract of the book for free. I'll put a link to that as well. And you you should and could of course um, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, next time, uh, in the next episode, it will be more of a, a standard audiobook chapter, which will be about um, the the messages and uh, what are the really uh, the gist of creative messaging when we're talking about uh, personalization uh, as, and, and messages being one type uh, of content, whereas content feeds will be one of the others. So I hope that you will uh, listen in uh, to that next time. And... Uh, Without any further ado, I'd like to say thank you for listening in on this, and I hope to see you again. Thank you for listening in on this episode of Hello First Name. Remember that all models and even a written abstract of the book are available for download. Do find the link in the show notes. In our next episode, which is a classical audiobook chapter, we'll be discussing content part one, messages. What are messages? How do they differ from other types of content? How can you create different forms of value with the right messages? Why is a personalized message so important when working with outbound communication?